All right. That's a great story, Mike. And uh, I see with the mullet now I understand the bike thing and the whole works. And I got to give you credit, though. I had that hair, and it's back in style, so good for you for keeping it that long. <clears throat> Before our next speaker speaks, uh, you know, we talked about the evolution of the game and about how it's changed, and it's certainly changed in different aspects. We talked about analytics, we talked about, you know, we touched on that, and you guys are going to hear a lot of that kind of stuff and, and, and conversation from the coaches that are here today that'll speak. One of the biggest changes that I've noticed or had noticed as an athlete was I came in when you came to training camp, it was two weeks long, you had two a days. Um, I know Dallas is speaking here today, and he'll t you know can touch on that. I mean, uh, the, you hated training camp; it just wore you out. It was two a days. It was, it was miserable. Guys trying to make the team, and they're trying to get in shape, and guys really didn't get in shape until, you know, around November. Really, the kind of shape you need to be in play. And now they came in. The evolution of it started. We had one bike in St. Louis. We had one stair machine, and we had a universal and some free weights. But we had a universal that was shoved into the corner because we didn't have enough room so you could use one side of it. Gino Cavallini used to get on the bike after practices and after games and he used to drive Brian Sutter crazy. He'd say, you know why he's on that bike? Because he didn't work hard enough during the game. It certainly changed. Brett Hall went, I'm, I feel like I'm picking on Brett here, but Brett Hall went to camp one year after he scored 86 goals and we were doing fitness tests. First time it was going to be these long tests, all right? You know, vertical jump, you know, you put your hand up, you, you touch the, the, you know, the, the meters, and then you jump and see how high you can touch again and then measure your vertical, and they want him to reach up and touch. And he goes, what? Uh, Mr. Hall, this kid's terrified of him from Washington University. You know, he's probably some intern. What do you want? I want well, Mr. Hall, we want you to see how high you can raise your hands in the air. What? What would I do that for? Just put your hands, we just want to see how high you can raise your hands. So Brett goes like this. I did it 86 times last year. <laughs> there was going to be no vertical jump. But the gentleman speaking next, Dr. Stephen Norris, he's a leading performance consultant in, in sports science and uh, his accolades go on and on and on. Dr. Norris is the director of sport uh, physiology and, 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 and strategic planning at the Canadian Sports Centre in Calgary. Um, if you know Canada's uh, Olympic Training Centre, and he was a part of three Olympics and probably more, but 02, 06, and, and 2010. Dr. Norris is uh, associate professor at Mount Royal University and the University of Calgary in Alberta and has spoke all over the world in performance behavior and excellence in sports. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Stephen Morris. Good morning. I'm gonna annoy the cameramen because I do like to wander around. I'm sorry for that in advance. Um, impact is what I'm going to be talking about. Impact. I hope last night, as we listened to the amazing hockey royalty, can't really else describe them but that, about the actual salient points they made, because there were absolute nuggets in there. First and foremost, pretty much a waste of time teaching young children systems, and I'll go through the reasons for that later on. Focus on the basics, no magic bullet. Fundamental skill, skating, forwards, backwards, side to side, diagonally, through traffic, someone hanging off the back of you, whatever it might be. Turn left, turn right. Inside edge, outside edge. And we forget about that. It's a bit like trying to make a water polo team, but you can't swim. And how much time do you really pay attention to that certainly in that first decade to a decade and a half of life. 
Then you've got the actual fundamental capability of handling the puck, particularly in that area that you actually control, which is the reach of your stick, or the reach of the glove, or whatever it might be. Because that's really what you can control. And I should be able to throw a puck to a kid and say, show me what you can do with that puck. Knock yourself out. Because remember this phrase, and I've stolen it from soccer, from football. While it's true that all great jugglers of the ball are not great soccer players, all great soccer players are great jugglers of the ball. Replace ball with puck. You can't do anything with that puck any time, any place, under any conditions. Forget about playing hockey at any reasonable level. So get back to the basics. Listen to what those guys said. Fantastic stuff. I just want to mention USA Hockey. First off, you can tell by my accent. One, I'm not even Canadian, let alone American. And what the hell does an Englishman know about uh, a game played on ice? Mm, Not a lot. But my very first day on the job over 20 years ago was with Tom Rennie and Mike Johnston, dealing with Canada's in-residence national program in Calgary. And I had a rich baptism over the last two decades. And I've watched very carefully this game. And because I get to see lots of different sports, I can see the trends very clearly. And one of the most magnificent things I've seen is the growth of USA Hockey over the last, certainly the last decade, and particularly over the last five years. The commitment of resources to the community, to the grassroots, to the foundation. Yeah, we can focus on the national teams. They're the glitz, they're the sexy bits. But the, but the actual grassroots programming is the bread and butter. It is the future. So I want to make sure that you understand that and my commitment to you, all of you, because I get to work with coaches and high-performance directors every day. And as a sports scientist, my job really is to be almost invisible, to be seen but not heard, to blend into the background and only really offer my advice when I'm asked for it. And I have to live with the fact that at the end of the day, the coach calls the shots. And I'm perfectly fine with that. But my job is wrapped up in the Japanese principle of Kaizen, continual improvement. Every year, we all strive to get better. So we're going to have some fun. I'm going to talk about impact a little bit with you. One of the first things, of course, is um, I uh, basically throw the proverbial rock in the pond, cause some ripples. I do not expect you to believe what I say, to agree with everything what I say, but I do expect to try and touch some of your buttons to cause you to think about what you do. And that word change. Change is life. The game of hockey, if you're prepared to be truly honest, go back even 10, but go back 20 years into the 90s and just watch the video of the game compared to last season. Look for the changes, things that hit you straight in the face, the speed, the way in which even the players shoot predominantly these days, increasing ambidextrousness in the game, the ability to do a gross motor skill whilst doing a fine motor skill. What I mean by that is the ability to skate at full speed, not go to the glide and still pass or shoot the puck. And it's still a tragedy that so few, even at the highest level of the game, can do that. But more and more, as each year passes, we see phenomenal stuff. And the kids that some of you are teaching, those five to ten-year-olds, you have to have in your mind, what will the game look like for them when they're at their peak, 25 to 35 years of age? So that's 20-odd years in advance. Because it's not going to look like now. It's all about this. And these are the three areas I'm going to talk to you about today. People, you, the kids, the youth, and any of you fortunate to deal with some of the superstars, perhaps them too, the places in which you do it and the type of programs you design. You should become experts in asking questions, always, including this one. Why do you do it? We're not curing cancer in this room. We're not dealing with world peace, although perhaps sport can have a role there. We're not doing the fundamental things of humanity, but I would suggest to you this, that sport 
is another one of the performance arts. It is in our soul, every last fiber. And here's the real kicker. You're dealing with our most precious resource on this planet, our children and youth. And that is a phenomenal responsibility because it's their lives, not ours. Their lives. And we shouldn't be playing with them. We've almost got to be stoic enough to say, we're going to take this very seriously, but at the same time, we've got to make it as fun as possible. So think about it. What kind of environment do you create that is challenging yet fun, that wants these kids to be hungry and come back day in, day out, week in, week out, season in, season out? Because you control that, and I don't care what kind of resource level you have. You don't need huge amounts of money to create a great environment, an environment where failure is part of the process. And you build these resilient kids where they're able to pick themselves up, dust themselves off, and get back to the task in hand. Because life isn't easy, it's not fair, and if they want to be the best they can be, no matter what level that could be, they've got to deal with failure en route to success eventually. And you control what that environment looks like. Purpose. It's in our name. It's what drives us. And it's our commitment to you. Hi, I'm Sam Safe. My goal has always been to make investing for Canadians better and cheaper. That's what Purpose is all about. We take a long-term perspective that combines low fees with a real focus on risk management. That's investing with Purpose. To learn more, speak with your advisor or visit PurposeInvest.com. So why would I show you 30 seconds of an investment advertisement. Why would I show you that? Because the clarity of that guy's messaging was superb. In 30 so seconds, he established a level of trust with you exactly about what he was doing. You knew immediately that he had a sense of purpose about what he was doing. Two, how fair he was going to be with you and with him. And he built that trust element. Is the clarity of your messaging as clear as that? to your parents, to your kids, to your sponsors, even to the person that looks after the rink that you have to utilize. Clarity of messaging. And before you rush after things like, you know, your mission and vision and all these type of things, you need to seriously think about your purpose. What are you trying to do? Does everyone understand that very, very clearly? And challenge others in your organization if you have more than one age group, if you're in your particular situation. Is it very clear what you're trying to do? As we go through this journey of life, and you could probably pick out roughly where you are or who you're actually dealing with, you need to think about this. And this is where I'm going to challenge you hard and I'm going to come at you with a vengeance. You have, sitting here right now, had these odds, one in 400 trillion that you're sitting here right now, that you were born. That's the probability. That makes winning the lottery look bloody easy. And you owe it, not only to yourself, but to all those other poor sperm that didn't make it. <laughs> you do. But here's the thing. I want you to seriously, seriously consider that responsibility. What are you doing with your life? Because I tell you, this stuff that you're doing with these children and youth, and these young men and women, is important. I was at the University of North Dakota earlier in the year. A massive shrine, a Taj Mahal to hockey. And you're in the owner bo owner's box there, and there's a black and white photograph on the wall, big one, with a little plaque underneath. There's this guy in net minding gear from about the 1940s and 50s, and I don't need to mention his name. And this kid was a third string goalie at the university back in the 40s and 50s. Had a save percentage of 0.975 because he didn't play very much. You're meant to laugh at that. The story is, that, however, he hardly played third string. Only if someone was sick, injured, did he get a chance. He turned up at every practice, worked very, very hard, gave his all, was never going to make a 
a professional career. But he rolls on the next few decades, becomes a gazillionaire in the business world. And when his alma mater came calling for help, he's the one that anted up the $130 million that built that new magnificent hockey temple. So the message that you've heard constantly already over the first 12 hours of this meeting here, you have no idea where these children are going in their lives. They are the parents of the future, the coaches of the future, the benefactors of the future, the sponsors of the future. They have to be the advocates of the future, so you damn well better give them one of the most amazing experiences of their life. Because you have no idea. And sure, amongst them, those precious few, the type of people we saw sitting on the stage last night, these will be the few that entertain us in the future, that do these amazing things that we see week in, week out on the television. And if we're lucky, perhaps in person, if we get to go to a game or the World Championships or the Olympics. So remember this responsibility. Now, Canada last year, Health Canada came out and said this. The average life expectancy for a male, 80 years of age, female, 84. That's around 29,000 days, 30,000 days. Okay? Of course, you don't actually have that total amount of time, your sleep, part of it, doing all sorts of other things. But what I want you to think about is this. If you took out a tailor's tape, you know, the type of tape that for the men, we go and get a shirt and they put tape around to measure your neck size. You put your left thumb on your age now on the tape. Okay, that number, whatever your age is. And then with a good estimation of your familial history of life expectancy, put your right thumb. And then you hold it up. That's how much time you've got. Truly. Now, some of us in the room may have this, and some of us in the room may have that. The issue is, are you going to use it productively? What is going to be your legacy? What are people going to say about you? Because you need to understand this, time, time is the one thing you can't buy and you have precious little of it in the grand scheme of things. Once it's gone, it's gone. Can't get it back. So I applaud you for being here because that suggests immediately that you want to learn. You truly want to be a lifelong learner. You want to push the envelope. You want to take everything that you know and grab everything that everyone else is know, knows so you can push the marble forward and you can help these kids. And obviously, because we all have egos, vicariously help yourself. Because you want to be appreciated, I assume. The problem we have is the fact that we're limited by our comfort zone. What I mean by that, as we age, what we're comfortable with gets narrower and narrower and narrower. We get more complacent. We don't step outside of our own conservatism. And yet this is a recipe for disaster, not only for ourselves, but for the youngsters we deal with. Because one of the critical things is you must open your minds to the concept of how the world constantly evolves around you. The world is doing this at a time with each of the years of your passing, this happens. Think about it. If we actually added up the years of experience in this room now, we're into thousands of years of hockey, thousands of years. And then with each one of us, we've got experience in our own domain of other stuff. We should be able to solve any damn problem, certainly to do with hockey, that we care to turn our attention to. If we let ourselves do that, but of course, you don't. You don't. Why is that? Because you don't want to push the marble forward, you don't want to rock the boat, you don't want to step outside, you don't want to do stuff. You have little voices that say, oh, I've tried that, didn't work, or we've always done it this way, etc., etc. You know the drill. All I'm telling you is, we are our own worst enemy. And we have no one else to blame except ourselves. And yet here we are charged with doing the very best thing for these children who aren't encumbered by narrow comfort zones. Theirs is a sense of wonder. Even if I said the word hockey to you, instantly into your brain pops some kind of vision of what hockey looks like right now. And with nostalgia, what it used to look like. 
The problem is you can take that strength, you've got to use that experience, but be able to expand it to what it potentially can look like. So I'm going to show you cycling, a cyclist right now. And immediately, me saying that, there's a picture of what cycling might be. You may have watched the road race at the Olympics just recently, and well done to the United States for the female result. But this is cycling that takes things to a new domain. So imagine replacing the word cycling with hockey. Hockey is what you've thought of instantly, but where hockey could go. This is Danny McGaskill, Team GoPro, Red Bull. Desde Radio El Escorcio, como cada mañana le invitamos a disfrutar otro maravilloso día soleado en las palmas de Gran Canaria. La temperatura ambiente es de unos 22 grados, sin apenas viento y con la mar en calma. Sin duda, otro perfecto día para pasarlo en la playa. Oh! 
I don't know what hockey looks like 20 years from now, but I know it doesn't look like what it looks like right now. So these youngsters, you've got to prepare them for what that future could possibly look like. And they need to be able to do anything imaginable with that puck. Anything. Any time, any place, under any conditions. Performance on demand. So for those of you dealing with the younger groups, your experience, but unleashing their creativity, a word we heard a lot about yesterday. The NHL guys, creativity. Do you create that environment, so your creativity, to allow that environment to blossom? Or do you stifle them? Do you force them to play in a particular way? Hockey is nothing if it is not problem solving. And there are a thousand and one ways to solve a problem. Let them find a way. Let them find what works and what doesn't. That's your job. Hallmark of great coaches, the hallmark of great coaches, and I've worked with many who leave me in awe, is that they take averagely good people and make them great. They make good people superb. They take great people and make them amazing, and they stay out of the way of the true phenoms and help them really exercise their skills. That's the hallmark. You can make everyone better or at least help them. As I said before, it's their lives, not ours, and it's almost a mantra that I believe you should have. Certainly you'll have your own personal goals, no question about that. But at the end of the day, if you're truly a coach, high performance director or what have you, or even a parent, you're nurturing these youngsters along on their pathway. Very clear. Here's an excellent little short video. It's an advertisement for California. Sorry about that. But think about what the parents say, because they made themselves think. There's a little bit early on with the mother where she talks about the fact that the daughter asked why she wasn't doing something. And it made her and her husband think about why. You'll see it if you listen carefully. And then the father talks about you know, constraining the little kid and being frightened. Then he admits, of course, that she's better than him, so what does he know? Here's Bella and the pink helmet posse. Three, two, one, go! We didn't choose the color pink. It just happened. Who's going to win? Oh, I won. Look at your stop. <laughs> The Pink Helmet Posse is just a movement of girls to skate. It happened because my husband and his two friends got together and they all had daughters. When they showed up at the skate park for their skate date, they were all wearing pink helmets. And so they just started getting called the Pink Helmet Posse organically. Bella was five years old and her brother was taking skate lessons and I remember her saying, why am I not doing this? So we put her on a skateboard and she hasn't stopped since. This is my room. This is my skateboard. It says, have a little fun today. Create your own happiness. Dream big. Follow your heart. I think California had a big influence on who Bella is and becoming because of the lifestyle that you get to live here. I mean, she surfs and skates every day of her life. I don't even know if she knows how good she has it here. I started skating when I was about 12, so I was in middle school. I started skating when I was five! Must be nice. <laughs> it's really good when you're young and you can get involved because it's like you have this big open canvas to kind of do whatever you want. It's a lot like art in that sense of creativity. And so girls like Bella, especially girls who start young, are going to have a real influence not only on people younger than them, but kind of anyone they come in contact with because it's very inspiring, especially when a younger person's doing it. get scared sometimes, but you gotta face your fears and just do it. One time in particular, she wanted to drop in the deep end of this really big bowl. I tried to talk her out of it. She was gonna do it. So I stood in the bottom like I could actually catch her or something. And she pulled it, and she was fine, and then I'm all, hey, can you do it again so I can get a photo? 
<laughs> I do get scared, but she's better than me, so what do I know? My dream is to have at every skate park a bunch of girls skating. My dream is when I go to my favorite skate park, I'm going to see more girls than boys. My dream is I want to be a dolphin trainer. <laughs> My hopes and dreams for Bella and for girls like Bella is that they don't hold themselves back from anything. They find something that they're passionate about and something that they love to do because it's really rewarding and it feels really great to love to do something so much. I can't imagine living this lifestyle anywhere else. If you can dream it, you can do it and California is the place to do it. You know, it's just a really big melting pot of a lot of creativity and I think Bella is a perfect example of that. Nine years old, nine years, would have never had that chance unless the parents had the foresight to open their minds. Do you do the same? Do you create that kind of environment? You saw failure there. She came off a skateboard, slid on her knees. Father was scared and protective, but allowed her to go for it. And then did you listen to her words? Because her mind is open. She's not narrow yet. You have to face your fears and go for it. Or do you, or is your comfort zone so tight now that you dare not go there? Or is that living? Have you become, instead of being a human being, you're now simply a human doing? I want you to live. I want you to be vibrant. I want you to reach your potential. So for God's sake, be and not simply do. The youth. Here's the real challenge for us. So this is a brain scan. From the younger brain on the left-hand side to the older brain on the right-hand side. Above the black line, the bit to the right of the brain, so towards the right side of each of the shots, is the front part of the brain, frontal cortex, prefrontal lobe. This is an element of the brain that develops somewhat later late teens through into the early 20s. This is responsible for all the type of things that we revere as adults. Dealing with authority, playing by the rules, being on time, not sleeping in bed till noon on Saturdays. So before you get on the case of, of teenagers, understand that they're hardwired at that point in their lives to behave that way, not deal with authority that well, be late, be sloppy, what you need to do is start to frame their existence, put into the place those values that you hold to, how they treat each other, the respect, and shape them, but understand that they are what they are. They are not miniature adults. So even as they're going through, even though they may look like young men and young women physically, they're still not there yet. And remember, over the first two and a half decades of life, the primary driver of performance capability is growth and maturation. You're just superimposing on top of that and helping them in other areas, such as skill. But the primary determinant is growth. This is why you have such a problem in games where you look for performance success early on as the only metric, because you will notoriously start to choose the early developers and forget about the late developers. How stupid is that? Because you should realize very clearly the number one driver of international performance at the 70,000 foot level is population size involved in that particular pursuit. So if you narrow it too soon, you're screwed. You want as many kids playing this game as late as possible into the high school years, as late as possible. I'm a physiologist, supposedly of high performance, and I will tell you the stable platform for human performance we don't even see outside of a few phenoms until about 23, 24, 25 years of age, non-gender specific. And remember, humans are, so, uh, are, are uh, designed to be at our peak somewhere between 25 and about 40 years of age for the physical aspects. The power sports, 25 to 35, the endurance sports, obviously much later into that third, fourth decade of life. That's why we don't see that many hockey players really last that long into their late 30s and 40s. 
They have to be highly motivated and injury-free if they're going to survive that. And the clock is ticking. Don't hold on to the muscle mass. Don't hold on to the speed of execution. It's just the way it is. But also, by the same token, even though the draft may be at a teenage year, they're kids. They're not even at their peak, the vast majority. So don't rush them. The greatest gift you can give anyone is your attention. Again, it's all wrapped up in time. If you give someone your, inten your attention, you're giving them your time. That's why it's the greatest gift. You're giving them something that you can never get back. And if you give them the appropriate attention, it's like giving someone water to the plant or fertilizer to the crops. You're nurturing them. You have to build confidence and reinforce belief through the teenage years, in particular because they're going through some struggles, finding their place in the world, growing like weeds, dealing with the fact that on any given day they could be quite a bit worse than they were previously, just because of the changes that are going on for them, if you recognize it. And you have to get them through the tough times. The easy times, no problem. At the end of the high school years, as far as I'm concerned, this should be your checklist of key performance indicators. Have I helped build active, skilled, imaginative, resourceful, and resilient players that can play any time, any place, under any circumstances, under any coach, and any system? Have you really done that? Because here's the funny thing. These kids don't get that many coaches in their lifetime. And one screw up for them has a big impact. And while someone has to be someone's last coach, here's the thing I would never want to have on my epitaph that I am the last coach of a bunch of 10 year olds, or 12 year olds, or 14 year olds, or even 16 year olds. That's a damning indictment. Why did they leave the game? I had an asshole coach. Didn't help me. You always want to be thinking about how are you preparing them for the next step. So let's talk about us for a little bit. So there's me. According to Health Canada, when you remember the ages, I've got about 24 years left. That's 8,760 days. The problem is I don't have 8,760 days. I only have 2,920. Sorry, that's wrong. I'm talking ahead of myself. 2,920 of them I don't have because I'm asleep out of the 8,000. And worse still, the other 110, I'm sitting on the toilet. <laughs> the only good thing about that, of course, it is quality time. <laughs> and I do do a lot of my productive thinking. I read the newspaper, I read Garfield, all those type of things. But what I've decided to do in the last third of my career is truly refuse to be average. So I'm prepared to give up my weekends to work with coaches, to come to conferences like this and try to throw that rock, whether you agree with me or not, to cause the ripple to make you think. That's my job, to make you think. So you go away from here and you commit and remember, commitment is 100%. You can't be 70% committed to make a difference, to think yourself critically about what you do. And if you don't think you can teach an old dog new tricks, here's Neil Pert. Who's Neil Pert? The greatest percussionist of our generation, without a doubt. The lead percussionist, the main drummer for the band Rush. Now, a few years ago, he had, had an unfortunate life-changing event. He lost his wife and daughter in a tragic accident. The band took a hiatus and he got on his motorbike and rode around North America, Central America and South America. And he became enamored with jazz. But the problem for him was because he had specialized in rock over 30 to 40 years, his brain was hardwired for rock rhythms. He could handle the rhythms of rock. What he couldn't handle was the underlying foot pattern in jazz.
But he had the patience and the wherewithal to become a true student of the pursuit, gave himself the chance, and over several months changed his behavior until eventually he put together this piece of video for us as a sense of wonderment. As you look late into the video clip, look at the amount of syncopation, the ability to completely do something with the upper body, completely out of whack with what was going on with the lower extremes. No different than a hockey player skating at speed through traffic and not going to the glide and therefore losing speed and still thread the needle with the pass. Or the netminder through traffic, he's having to move and with a simple task, reach for the glove save. No different. But it all came down to what he had done 40 years earlier. Do you give these kids the chance to do absolutely everything? Or do you narrow them? Their lives, not ours. So when I first started working on this and trying to do something, it was all I could do really just play the foot pattern and then try to start introducing the simplest possible stickings across it. So his tipping point, unfortunately, was that tragic, life-turning event. I wouldn't wish that on you. You have to become your own tipping points to make the change, to be self-critical, to push the envelope, to aspire to the Japanese principle I said before, Kaizen, continual improvement. You have to do that. Or in your own group, your team of coaches, or your organization. So this is the only tattoo, as far as I'm concerned, we should each have. Kaizen. Don't need any others. This sums it all up for us. Think of it this way. The steering wheel in the car. Basic roll, turn the front wheels. But even at the basic level, the car manufacturers know that for any amount of time we've got less than two hands on the wheel, an unfortunate event could happen. So they put the uh, horn in the middle of it, they put some stalks around it. Pretty basic. Now this wheel has been just retired from Jeep and their new basic wheel looks a little bit different than this. Because, of course, they have watched what's happened above them. So the next steering wheel up does all sorts of things right at the steering wheel. It's got paddle shifters for its DSG automatic gearbox. It's got uh, everything that controls the onboard computer. It's got the airbag. It's got everything within hand reach or thumb reach. But of course, no one rests on their laurels. And this car can do about, I don't know, 240 kilometers an hour. So now you move to a car that can do 300 miles an hour. Uh, sorry, 300 kilometers an hour. So this young, more recent Ferrari has big, big paddle shift, as you can see. If you look very carefully on the top, uh, sort of uh, at uh, about uh, 11 o'clock and 1 o'clock, you can see the indents where even by simply moving the thumb, you can press the horn. It's not in the middle of the steering wheel because you don't want to be taking your hands off the steering wheel to go to the middle of the, the wheel at 
It's 300 kilometers an hour. You can even turn the indicators right on the center aspect of the, each of the wheel, either side of the center there. You can turn the lights on. You can change the speed of the windscreen wipers and turn them on and off. You can start this car. You can change the suspension. And you can change the onboard diagnostics all from the steering wheel. Kaizen, just continue improvement of the steering wheel. And they're coming to a cars that we will have one day, that all of us can afford. And then if you look at the epitome of a steering wheel, this is last year's Formula One wheel for the Team Lotus with 36 different functions on this steering wheel. You can even change the bite of the clutch electronically from the steering wheel, depending on when the first corner is going to appear from one racetrack to another. He can even press a button, it squirts water into his mouth. The point is, wherever you draw the line in the sand, wherever you set the standard, it can always be raised. BMW, a few years ago, when they launched one of their new incarnations of the 3 Series said, when you set the bar, you are obligated to raise it every so often. Well, do you do that with yourselves? Or are you still doing the same stuff you've always done? Because that's a recipe for disaster. Sure enough, at times you're going to have to hit the hazard warning life. You're going to certainly have people take pot shots at you, particularly if you're trying to buck the trend. You're trying to do something. You're not too worried about winning. Because remember, if you're in age group, so for me, anything in hockey up to about the age of 18, the goal surely is to help them get better every single year. That's the goal. I don't give a damn about who wins, because I can tell you very clearly across all the sports, 85 to 96% of the age group champions are not the people that win when it matters. They're not. The United States Olympic Committee has phenomenal data on where your Olympians come from. We just tend to ignore it. I don't know why, because we don't get it. And we want to win that next meaningless trophy at age 10. Well, there is no such thing as a 10-year-old champion, a 14-year-old champion, a 16-year-old champion. These are redundant concepts, perhaps only in the female artistic sports. And even gymnastics a few years ago raised the age that they would allow competition at for females. But for males? You've got more time to develop them than females. You know for a fact, clearly, that girls develop sooner. When they hit the growth spurt, that marks the end of childhood. And yet childhood was the greatest period for skill acquisition that you will face. So in girls at around 10, 11, boys 13, 14, don't squander it. And for those of you dealing with females, you better get it right because you've got less time. Less time. And I get fed up with NHL teams phoning me up and saying, Steve, I've got a 23-year-old defenseman. Can we send him to you for a week, teach him to skate backwards better? No! Are you out of your mind? You'd have to do something like Neil Peart did, take months off. But no one has the patience by then. Because, rightly so, once you get to the NHL, it's all about prepare, compete, recover. Prepare, compete, recover. But en route to that, the two decades before that, it's not. It's about getting better every year and paying attention to growth and maturation and realizing that is not a linear rate of improvement in kids. It's all over the place, including some steps backwards at times. And you're responsible for nurturing this. Let's talk about these people. Assholes. There you go, I said it. 2007, Professor Robert Sutton at the Harvard Business School wrote a phenomenal little white book. I suggest you will get it myself, OK? I have no commercial involvement in the book, called The No Asshole Rule, written for the business community. You can even look up some of the Fortune 500 companies that actually have a bottom line signified by the letters TCA, the total cost of assholes. And this is where I'm going to get a little bit on the case of the concept of volunteerism. Volunteerism is not an excuse for poor performance. Just because you're not getting paid for something does not allow you to squander that responsibility of doing the best you can. It does not allow you to abdicate responsibility for moving with the times, for pushing the envelope. I hear that all the time. I deal with the monolith 
in the country that I live in, where we at times are frightened to introduce things that we know are correct because we have to deal with the groundswell grassroots movement. And yet it's the ground, it's yet it's the grassroots movement that really holds the future. Should be the one entity that isn't frightened to change, isn't frightened to constantly improve, isn't frightened to move ahead. Not simply the national teams. In fact, the national teams, we should be putting into practice things that we clearly know work. And be very cautious about making change until we're really sure. But with our youngsters, we should be throwing the doors wide open. Pushing, pushing, pushing. And you'll hear that phrase a little later. The problem with assholes is, of course, in any situation, the organization is not going to have Kaizen. Why would anyone want to try and improve an organization of assholes? What, we're going to have more assholes? <laughs> Why would you want to innovate? Why would I want to work hard to try and innovate something? Because the guy I'm working with is an asshole. Cooperation. Who wants to cooperate with an asshole? I certainly don't. I don't want to give up my time. We have team cohesion? No. None of that. And are you going to attract the best? No, because everyone looking in from the outside at you says, those guys are a bunch of assholes. <laughs> so don't tolerate them. Have the goal, have the value set that actually says, you know what, to a parent, even a kid that's an asshole, you can play hockey, or you can, you can bring your kid for hockey, but just not here. There's another program down the road. This is what we stand for, this is what we're going to do. And we do not deviate from that because we have, at our heart, the best interests of your kid. Or an official or an administrator, or yourself when you look in the mirror. Because we're all assholes at times, including me, for saying this. But unless we have these conversations, we will not move. So it's pretty simply for me, I just, uh, you're going to get this in your notes. This is just a diagram to really set the tone about language. You'll notice HP, high performance sport, doesn't occur till pretty late on. And even in those age groups, it's about getting them ready for the next step. So if you're a coach of, a four, of the U14s, what are you doing to make sure that as you hand them off, they are prepared for U16s? Or if you're in the first touch of hockey, five through the seven years of age, what are you doing? Because surely it's your job and responsibility to get them ready for whatever is coming next in their lives. And the metric around performance, the metric around the meaningless bauble or trophy, is the wrong metric to look at. Is their skating better? Is their puck possession better? If I throw them the puck, can they show me some amazing stuff that they can do with it? Can they turn left, right, get up on one foot? Can they skate on the outside of the blade and the inside of the blade? Can they pass with reasonable accuracy? Can they receive the puck with increasing levels of velocity of that puck coming onto the blade? AKA soft hands. Do they think about the game without being taught that they have to go and stand on the blue line when X happens? Do they know what to do? Do they understand game theory? Let's do some boring stuff to finish. Along the bottom, age, two through to 22, okay? Vertical scale, percentage where 100% is the adult final state. Okay, so this is where you appear at about age 23 through 25, when things have started to stabilize. First line is the neural development curve, aka brain weight, brain size. You'll see it changes rapidly in the first few years. And you'll know babies have big heads, don't they? They're out of whack because that brain is responding to all the new stimuli and then gradually the rest of the body starts to catch up. And the brain builds this capacity, it's like the internet, it's building its highway of communication in that first decade and a half. Then at about 14 years of age, it starts to ruthlessly cull those synaptic junctions it doesn't use that often. And you get a plateauing. Now don't think that brain growth is over, I just showed you what Neil Perk could do in his 50s. It's just the level of change, the plasticity, the elasticity, the scope is huge in that first decade and a half. This should scream at you, I mean scream at you, 
why you expose children to as many different stimuli as possible, why you do not early specialize. You absolutely throw everything you can imaginable at them so that their brains develop. Absolutely. Compared to this line, which is the one we often focus on, this is a rough representation of the circulating levels in our blood of the male sex hormone testosterone present in males and females, of course, but a higher level in males. This is the one that, as it is a downstream signaler of change around puberty. Without this stuff, of course, you can't put on massive muscle mass. So no point doing strength for muscle mass gains before you get into your mid to late teens. Not going to happen. Kids are getting stronger because of the top line, the neural curve. Plus, they're growing anyway. So they're going to naturally get a bit stronger, but they're getting stronger because they're learning how to use their muscles, a.k.a. a skill. So kids doing manic NHL-type training programs too early in life, why? The good people, you're going to hear Mike Boyles later on, phenomenal, have modified programs. They understand what to do through the progression over the years. Compared to this line, this is the overall line. This actually follows somewhat along the lines of fat-free mass even. Sigmoidal, period of rapid change in the first few years, period of relative stability, lots of opportunity in those mid-years. Look how both lines are quite stable from about six years of age to about 14 years of age. Prime time, skill, 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 skill. Basic motion, sport specific. Basic motion stuff, sport specific. Then all hell breaks loose when they go through puberty. Good luck with that one. <laughs> Compared to this, first two decades of life along the bottom, this is rate of change in a calendar year. Rate of change. Here's females. This is their rate of change in height. There's the, the growth spurt you can see. That big blip you can see is about 12, 13 years of age in most girls. That's when they're growing at their greatest, typically. Compared to boys, you didn't need me, me to tell you that they grow a little bit later. But of course, they grow um, to a much greater extent, so the boys end up taller. Bone mineral density comes a little bit later, so the bones grow lengthwise first before you actually get them to have any strength, and that's in response to loading forces. This period, as I said before, great period for teaching all the skills. For God's sake, make sure they can skate. God's sake, make sure they can do something amazing with that puck. Because in this period where we get very blinkered and we start choosing kids early, that period, you're not comparing apples with apples. They're apples and kiwi fruit and bananas and God knows what else at that period of time. Good luck really trying to find your best. You're just looking at Kodak moments in time. Some kids will be ahead of the curve, some kids will be behind. The problem you've got is it's very varied. Some kids grow very quickly, very soon. Others grow slowly over a longer period of time. So there's a lot of diversity. That's why you as a coach have to use your coaching eye and look at what's happening to these youngsters before your very eyes. And you need to look at the impact of maturation on physiology, the annual gain in performance capacity, for example. This is percentage change in a year on the vertical. Here's 11 through 22 years of age. So without you doing anything, just a kid growing, their VO2 max will change quite dramatically over this period of time. Why is that? Why is that peak happening at that time? Because they're growing. Growing tall, bigger lungs, bigger lung volume. No wonder their VO2 max goes up and you haven't done a thing about it. Remember, kids are very aerobic. You may put hockey equipment on them and rush them down the ice at 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. They're not even producing energy in the same way that they will when they're 25. Because of this. Anaerobic capacity develops much later. And this is very important if you're a senior player playing the game. In the same way that blood lactate, for example. Kids are not anaerobic. They're very fast in explosive way because of the neural system and they're very aerobic. The enzymatic pathways that eventually help them play hockey at the eventual level, not even apparent yet. So they may wear the same equipment, may rush down the ice, but they're doing it very, very differently. Another reason for really constructing coaching to be very different in terms of what you're doing. I put this in more for you to have afterwards. It's, I want you to think about what on one page would describe your sort of pathway through hockey and the big areas, skating, technical, tactical, etc., etc. 
That's just for your, you to have, and you'll, you'll get all that information. I need to finish off very quickly here for you. A critical lesson as I wrap it up. This is Yoda as the mentor to Luke Skywalker. And listen carefully, because it's quite quiet. All right, I'll give it a try. No. Try not. Do. Or do not. There is no try. Why is that? Because trying is lying. It's like me saying, I'm going to try and pick this up. I'm going to try and pick this up. What the hell does that mean? I'm either going to pick it up or I don't. I'm either going to do it or not. So you will either do things to improve or you won't. It's no good saying I'm going to try. The only trying that should be revered is in little kids when you're setting up the environment so the only failure for them is not to try, not to actually go and do it. But in the end, they actually do these things. But for you, there is no trying. Do or do not. End of story. I don't actually have time to show you this video, so I'm going to just move on from this and finish with this. If you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. Pretty damn simple. And you need to understand that the values that you exhibit need to be rock solid, because these are the behaviors where no one is looking. No one is looking. How do you behave? Do you pick your nose? Do you fart? Do you do all that type of stuff? Do you throw litter on the ground? Do you walk on the logo in the carpet when no one's looking? Or do you actually hold to these values? Because you are being watched every minute of the day when these kids are with you. And if you are inconsistent and you deviate, they will pick up on that. So you have to understand this. Say what you mean, mean what you say, and don't be mean when you say it. Thank you very much.